Hello, everyone, and welcome to uh, our very first podcast. This podcast is Unfiltered with Bob Z. On this podcast, we promise to give you the unfiltered truth, and we're going to uh, also talk about things that are current in the community, and I guess the world is a community now, it seems like. And so we're going to talk about world events, which are in turn community events. And today, our very first guest for our very first podcast is City of Norfolk School Board member from Ward 3. He represents Ward 3, uh, Mr. Carlos Clanton. Welcome, Mr. Clanton. How are you doing today? I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it was, it's, it's a pleasure. I've been, um, I've been watching and knowing uh, uh, Mr. Clanton for quite some time. He's always been a stalwart in the community, and so we're looking forward to what he has to say about some of the issues. And so we'll just jump right into it. Uh, as a school board member, as a school board member, um, I guess the, 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 the number one topic on earth right now <laughs> is the pandemic. So, you know, no matter, I mean, and I was just thinking that, you know, no matter who you are on this planet, the pandemic has affected you in some way. And that's every country worldwide. But so we're gonna try to narrow our focus just a little bit. <laughs> Um, <laughs> yeah. So, but um, I guess the big the big issue, or, or it, it's become um, not even just a health issue, but also a political issue, when we have the president saying, you know, open the schools, open the schools, and you know, just period, open the schools blindly. And so, um, I want to know from you, since uh, you are a resident expert on um, on the issue, and and I want to know how do you feel about the students. Um, logically not being able to return to school this fall? Uh, well, I appreciate the question, and thank you for having me here. Um, and as a member of the school board, um, I'm, I'm here speaking on what I think. Um, you know, we have protocols and things, and Indeed. so I'm not representing the board, but as a board right. member. Um, but when it comes to our students, um, I am always been an advocate um, that uh, making sure that we provide a safe and secure learning environment not only for our students, but for our staff members and our teachers, everybody who has to go in there each and every day. Um, do I want t children to be in the classroom? Is that the best place for them to learn? Absolutely. However, if I cannot provide without a certain or a shadow of a doubt that they're gonna be safe and secure throughout this pandemic, then no, I think uh, the board made a decision um, on uh, last month in July uh, to go to 100% uh, virtual learning um, which is going to be a totally different experience for our uh, students uh, compared to what they had in the spring. It's much more structured, um, like a regular school day. Um, but that's the only thing for the first nine weeks. And Norfolk led that. And now all the other school divisions here in Hampton Roads are following. Right. Well, um, I mean, it's, it's like I said, you know, you, you really don't have a choice. No. Every, every job or, um, that I've had and you know, every position has always been the first thing they talk about is safety. I mean, number one overall. So I don't see why, why it should change, change now and definitely now uh, with all the pitfalls. Um, and definitely when you think about the mm -hmm. um, asymptomatic symptoms, um, you know, you, you mentioned the president. Right. Uh, <laughs> you know, who has consistently talked about open the schools, open the schools. Um, but to be perfectly honest, it's the same thing. What we, we, if hopefully we've learned our lesson as we're seeing it right now when it was open business. We need to get back out here, and now we're seeing these spikes all over, including in rural America. Right. But the, the main issue with this particular um, virus um, is that it has asymptomatic symptoms, meaning that you can have it and not know it. Um, and when you start talking about the safety and security, it's just like having all of these people come in, students. Um, and I love our babies. But we got to know, especially our little ones, they, they carry germs. You know, they're the ones that's coughing and, and different things there. But we want to make sure that we provide an environment that when they come to school, they can learn. But most importantly, those who are taking care of them when they come back home, they know that they're not bringing something back. Right, exactly. I, I, I can recall, um, 
I also serve as a substitute teacher in the Norfolk and Port um, Portsmouth school systems. And, I, and for the very first time, I had a kindergarten class that I was substituting in. <laughs> and, you know, I went to substitute in the kindergarten class, and, and I was like, well, where's the teacher? <laughs> And they're like, she's out sick. <laughs> and so the teacher's assistant was coughing. And I was like, oh, oh my God, this is going to be, you know, and, 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 I, and I did catch a little something, um, you know, the <laughs> next couple of days. But I'm just, just trying to illustrate the point that, you know, um, while the, the immune systems of young kids may be stronger, but they, they do carry some, um, yeah. some germs and viruses and things like that. It's the same thing like wearing these masks. Right. You, wear the, you know, they say that you don't wear the mask just to protect yourself, but to protect the to others that are around others. you. And that's the same thing in, the, in those learning environments. Right. You gotta make sure that we can be able to protect everyone else that's around you. Right. Okay, my next question is, is probably is dealing with a local issue. Okay. Um, uh, we know that the uh, demolition of Young's Terrace, uh, Tidewater Garden, and Calvert Square housing projects has already been approved, so it's, I, I would imagine it's pretty much a done deal, and it will soon be underway. Uh, is there a plan in place to address uh, possible scenarios uh, of student um, relocation and you know how, how would you how would you approach this issue um, definitely uh, with this particular issue I mean which goes back and I've been following it uh, even in my professional role with the community action um, agencies that I work with um, when we look at our community look here at Norfolk and and just the history, um, you know, there's been a lot of feelings around this, redlining, you know, just you, just, you gotta know your history. Indeed. And why people feel the way that they do. Um, but I, I do believe that as long as we keep the lines of communication open um, and that we are transparent with individuals, um, it becomes a process that people can work with. It may not be easy, but it's something that we have to do intentionally. So I say all of that when we look at the public education component. Um, we have got uh, PB Young Elementary in Tidewater Park, um, you know, even Booker T. Washington, Jay Cox, Ruffner, all of those schools are in that vicinity. Um, Lindenwood, we even have some effect um, with right, that. Right. Um, and so the process and the planning is ongoing. We know that um, phase one is right around um, where it would cross the street from Ruffner, um, taking us all the way to Tower Park Elementary, right around to the school administration building. Um, that's the, the phase one. And so there is going to be some disruption when it comes to um, time to start planning mm -hmm. um, and, and as far as when you start moving and relocating folks. Um, so the planning is ongoing, that's what I can say, is that um, there will be a plan in place once we have kind of, you know, this whole pandemic has kind of thrown a wrench in some things too and slowed up some things. Um, but, yeah. <laughs> but they're, you know, Urban Strategies is the agency that's working um, with them there and, and they're, they're focused on how do you get, it's not just a relocation piece, it's about educating about finances and being able to take care of yourself in the respect of preparing outside of public housing, but then also to come back into a new level. But then when we look at our students, it's the same thing. It's like, how do we prepare for these schools? Is Tower to Park getting a new school? Because there's been some picture renderings that shows a new school. Well, right. what new I, school is I've that? I've seen those. But we haven't necessarily at the school division had a discussion about that. Mm. So there's the communication that has to still happen between the city. Um, I believe that it's ongoing. There's much better communication than there has been in, in the past. Um, I, unfortunately, this particular session, I'm not serving on the facilities committee, so um, I'm not in the day-to-day -day operations of that, but um, I can definitely say that there will be a plan um, that our community and our parents will be aware of how we will um, address the issue with our students to make sure that um, the least impact to them um, is felt. So it, it's ongoing. Okay, well, that's fair enough. That's fair enough. Um, I've always heard that all, all politics are local, you know, so. <laughs> And, and, and I, as promised, we, you know, um, I guess with the uh, advent of social media and all, you know, um, you know, this device here, the cell phone, it's, it's, it's changed the whole world. And I know for years I've watched, um, and I actually used to live across the street from where we are now, and we had this big, great big statue with Johnny Reb on top of it, you know, <laughs> triumphant, you know. And so... Um, my question now is uh, just given the current climate of uh, the fight for social justice everywhere, it seems like, you know, uh, even in Tokyo and Japan, I was amazed and, 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 and saddened at the same time because it took such a tragedy uh, as a George Floyd tragedy to, to, you know, galvanize this whole uh, movement. But bringing that all politics, this local uh, piece back, I, I just want to know, um, there's been a lot of renaming of schools, streets, 
federal, state buildings, et cetera. Um, what do you think will happen to uh, some of our schools named after Confederate war heroes and the like? Thank you for always, you know, giving me the, the hard questions. <laughs> well, <laughs> but we, we said unfiltered. unfiltered, unfiltered. <laughs> but, um, you know, I have lived in Norfolk my entire life. Um, three of the schools that are in question, of course, is W.H. Taylor Elementary, which I attended, um, Ruffner Academy, um, and, of course, um, anybody who knows me knows that I'm a proud Commodore um, that graduated from Maury High School. Um, those are the three schools that are named after Confederates that we've identified in the, uh, the board back in June during our retreat brought in the historians. Um, and in that process of them looking at the, the history, also identified um, nine other uh, schools that had some particular tie to wow. slavery. Oh my God. Um, and you know you wouldn't really look at it. And I'll give you a perfect example, uh, Campostella. Campostella. Uh, Campostella, you camp know, you kind of look at it, it's like, I mean, that don't, that don't, that don't look like anything, yeah. but it was a camp right. for the Confederacy that exactly. was named after the general's daughter, whose name was Stella. Stella. <laughs> so it was like, okay, and about 40 years after that, they just added an O to it right. to make it Campo Stella. So, um, you know, but that's a pretty easy one because if you wanted to go change that one, you just take off the, the academy, the STEM, you know, the STEM would, academy and just take off Camp Stella. Uh, I was going to say, would it be Camp or would it be Stella? <laughs> just take off Camp Stella. <laughs> but the, the general consensus that came out from the board, and they have, we have not taken a, an official vote on it, um, was mm -hmm. that we wanted to move towards changing these names. Right. Um, this is not an easy thing to do because when you think about it, um, particularly Amoria High School, which a lot of people don't realize was actually named Norfolk High School, um, but was changed as a part of the, um, the Lost Cause campaign. Of course, the Civil War ended, and there was a, um, a, uh, a, a very influential woman at the time um, who not only pushed for the name change at Moria High School, but also pushed to put that Johnny Red monument downtown. Oh. It, was, it was her. <laughs> she was behind all of that. Um, never stop learning. Never stop learning. <laughs> so we, we've gotten information, but I can't tell you, I've had hundreds of emails, mail that's come in to me, particularly for, uh, about Maury. Um, and my thing is, is that how do we maintain the history? Mm. Um, um, because at the end of the day, um, I've asked any of my class members who attended Maury High School, and it was nobody really, we knew the name was Matthew Fontaine Maury, but nobody really understood the history behind that. And for us, it was Maury High School. And you have some who say it's about what happens inside the school. It's not necessarily about the symbolism of a name outside of it. Um, and, you know, and we've looked up in Fairfield, um, I think it was Arlington, where they, a renamed um, school that was named after Robert E. Lee High School. Mm -hmm. Well, now it's John Lewis High School. Oh, yep. um, so there's a whole discussion, uh, even amongst the board, in respect of do we name schools after people? Um, our current policy says that you have to be deceased for 10 years because there's a petition out there to name Maury High School the Lewis Cousins High School. Mm -hmm. But Mr. Cousins, uh, who was a part of the Norfolk uh, 17, passed away in January. Well, he wouldn't qualify under our current policy. So there's a lot of discussion, but what I can tell folks is stay tuned because October the board will revisit this. We want to get schools open, get our kids going again, um, and we revisit this topic um, because it will fall into the policy. I am serving on policy committee this year um, to look at our policy and to bring some recommendations. And um, I know that our board chair is also looking at um, formulating a community commission around it so that both the board and the community have some input and buy-in to what potential names these schools could have. Well, um, I was just thinking when you were talking about naming the schools, I know that they changed the, uh, the name of the Redskins to the football team, so I don't know if they're going to just say the school. You know, just, <laughs> well, just, call just, it. just the school, the, the school Norfolk in Norfolk, school. yeah, back to its, yeah. own, to its history. Well, you know, and then this is the other thing, too. You know, mm -hmm. you've had some folks are saying, oh, can you find the middle of the road? Well, like with Maury, just take out the Matthew Fontaine and maintain the name Maury. Um, you know, it doesn't take any reference to Matthew Fontaine, but it's Maury High School. Um, you know, but then you have others like, that's not enough. <laughs> yeah, no, um, he got so, to go. <laughs> yeah, so it's... it's <laughs> I'm sitting down there, and, 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 and I will tell folks is that, um, you know, because for people probably, you know, you said unfiltered. I believe as a former national civil rights leader that we need to have change, that there is a movement that's happening right now. Right. Very much like in the 1960s, um, there is a wave of our new generation um, of folks who are like, you know, we have to continue this. And even with the, the death of John Lewis and C.B. Um, Vivian, that those individuals, um, that they're passing, um, 
you know, it's the time for us to pick up the mantle and to take up the, the march and to continue that um, and to get this Voting Rights Act passed. Right, right. We have to get that reauthorized. Yeah, yeah. Um, one of the things, I mean, you know, thinking about that, when the, I think the argument that many people might put forth is that you're trying to destroy history. And I, I, I you know, as a history buff myself, I mean, yeah. I. I study every war yeah. from the Revolutionary War and you know all of that to up until um, all the conflicts that we've been in, and I've studied it you know diligently. But I don't think it's a matter of um, preserving history. I think it's the celebration piece. You know, so yeah. when you build a monument to somebody, when you name a school after them, you know, you're kind of celebrating them. And I think that's the that's the real issue. And you know, people, you know, I guess people on the other side of that argument. And, and, if, and if I can add, yeah, in that sure. One, um, so. I've been talking with the, the cousins family, um, and, and you know, and I have, I believe that this city owes a great debt of gratitude to um, the members of the Norfolk 17. Um, you know, when people ask, well, what should we replace this monument with downtown? I believe that it should be a monument recognizing the Norfolk 17 because when you think about it, their single act and what they did that year changed the entire course and the history in this city. Um, but I also um, am, am moving, even in my high school, and this is the first time I'm saying this out to folks here, but okay. I've been working with our principal, with alumni, on how we can rename the auditorium at Moria High School as a part of the Lewis Cousins um, uh, Auditorium to place a nice case outside of that to put photos of his integration there and to work with the principal on freshman orientation, how that becomes a part of freshman orientation to educate them about what the significant wow. action that took place there at Moria High School. Um, I believe that those are important because people need to understand, our youth need to understand their history to know where they came from, how we got where we are today, and how they can continue to take this march forward. That's breaking news. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, um, having said that, um, you're a Commodore, proud Commodore. Yeah. I'm, I'm a Commodore, I'm from Grammy, so of course I was, when I'm, when they start searching for we names. can't be perfect, but it's good. Yeah, you know, but <laughs> he wasn't Confederate, but <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I looked up and, and I found that Granby is named after the Marquis of Granby, so I really couldn't I couldn't find any uh, any dirt under his fingernails, but you know well, I they'll, was, they'll say it was named after the street, Granby Street. Uh, but the Granby Street was you know was named, named after, after the Marquis. Yeah, exactly. It, and it's it's also it's, it's not the only Granby High School in the country. Mm. So I was like, wow, so that, some interesting, yeah, that is interesting. some I fun facts. See. Learn something Isn't every day. Something <laughs> <here>. <laughs> right. Um, okay. Um, my next question is. Um, you know, having substituted and, and, and my, my company, um, we run different programs, anti-bullying programs. We've done a lot of programs in the public schools. I have, I was really naive, and I have come to understand and see the vulnerability of a lot of, a lot of students that, are, that come from underserved communities, some that don't come from underserved communities, just um, vulnerable students. And um, I found that the schools were not just the schools. The schools were a safe haven. Uh, they were a source of food, a source of counseling, a source of, um, you know, just comfort and, and love from the teachers. But so with, I was thinking about, I, I know we can't because of safety. I know they can't open the schools. But I'm still hopeful that there may be something in place that um, some kind of safe haven for the kids, perhaps the um, school district can work with the um, the city as far as community centers or maybe libraries or something where where we you know and I think a lot of the the, the kids are uh, have been identified you know that we know that are in vulnerable situations and I was just thinking that you know I guess you can't say throw the baby out with the bathwater but you know if we just like blanket and put you know some of these kids are gonna need to not be in somebody's house when the, the, the um, you know, during the school year. So I don't have the answer to that, but I just wanted your thoughts on that. So um, I, this is so present and so real. I mean, I literally just had a conversation yesterday about how we could use some of our resources here, other locations um, that could partner with the school division, um, particularly in situations where you have parents who've got to go to work, but they can't afford or they don't have a means to be able to um, provide, um, you know, childcare. Um, being able to have a safe place that students can go in, continue with their learning, be able to practice the social distancing um, and the other COVID-19 safety measures we have in place. Um, so there are discussions that are happening there, but there are also, also something that um, I have to give great credit to our city 
um, and the ingenuity and thinking um, and forward thinking, um, they have two pop-ups that have, um, and I've been really widely out there um, pushing. Many folks may have heard about Open Norfolk and the focus that was on okay. small businesses and getting them back safely and being able to open, but the city took a step forward. Um, and, and further, and they did the Open Norfolk, which is these open green spaces. So you've got five points. Okay. Um, and then you also have the old Richard Bowling site, um, ele um, elementary school, right mm -hmm. out there off of um, Princess Anne. And so they're doing programming. And there's a lot of youth-focused programming that's out there where you can social distance, kids can get out. Um, there's different classes that are going on. But there's partnerships that are happening even between the public schools and those spaces to even have our parents to come out and get trained um, our English language learners, um, the, which are primarily Spanish speaking and others who don't speak English, to have them come out and teach them how to use Dojo and teach them how to use some of the other things that are there. So there's partnerships and things that are happening. Um, this is, and I remind people all the time that we're in a time, none of us have been through a pandemic. Right. You know, right. last time we had something like this was almost 100 years ago. And so this is where we have to remember that we're in this together. It's not, you know, we have to really kind of, there, there's no crazy ideas. Everything needs to come on the table. Okay. And then we have to work to figure out how we can best manage this and help support one another. Um, but, I, you know, one of the, the things that ached me the most when I had to make the decision to go virtually, 100% virtual, um, was, again, thinking about those students, those particular students who the only safe haven that they had was to come to school, right. to get out of the house, exactly. to, to escape abuse. Um, and the truth and the reality is, is that there's a large uptick of numbers um, of, uh, of those cases that are occurring right now. Um, and I just, you know, working with our school psychologists and, and our school leaders um, and being able to create a way, and I've talked with our administration, is there a, a reporting way? You know, that kids through their computers, through, through, hmm. through the online, that they can report if they're not safe and they're in a okay, situation. That's great. Um, so there are things that are there. Um, we may not have the answer right now, but we are actively working to, to ensure that we can make sure that our, our kids are still safe and secure even while they're at home. Well, I think, we, I think, you know, just to kind of follow up on what you're saying, we have to enlist, you know, some of our, um, some of our community assets. Mm -hmm. You know, we have, to, we have uh, different, uh, uh, churches and different organizations that have nonprofits, and I think that you know, to like right now, we should put out a clarion call to say, hey, you know, you know our babies, you know, yep. we, we got to take care of our babies, and you know, um, moving moving to the, my next, I want to say I was going to say issue, but it's really a question. But for me, <laughs> it's probably the same thing, a question and an issue. Uh, but um, you know, not to date myself, but. Uh, I remember uh, I went, you know, went to Norfolk Public Schools myself, and you know, it was, it was just an issue of books, where you know, um, schools on the west side, you know, they had they had better uh, better books than we had. You know, that was I remember that being a fight in and of itself. So, you know, uh, with with the uh, bringing in of new technology, I just want to um, just kind of talk to you about you know where we're going as far as I have. Um, I still have family that live in, 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 you know, some of them live in the housing projects. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, you know, we just, you know, from Norfolk. So what about the technology like Chromebooks and, and all those things? Is, you know, are we checking to ensure that, you know, this evenly distributed with, let's say, this school versus that school? Um, I know that, you know, and I understand, and I'm not really like, you know, beating up on the school system, but. Um, my niece was doing uh, her homework on her um, phone. You know, she's a high school student, and she was doing her, and I was like, well, where's your Chromebook? And she didn't have her Chromebook. And I'm like, oh, okay. Um, let me see what I can do and, you know, start making calls. But what is the, um, you know, the school district or, you know, just talk to me a little bit about, you know, evenly distributing the uh, technology amongst all our students. Definitely, and probably that situation with your niece was back in the spring. It was, it was um, hectic. And, 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 and it, exactly, it was very hectic. I mean, literally, um, we knew two weeks we were gonna be out of school, and then the governor came back and said the school was shut down for the entire school year. And um, so we were in a scramble. I mean, that there's, there's no, and we weren't the only school division who was in the scramble. Now, uh, Virginia Beach uh, has a situation where they have one-to-one. -one. Each one of their students have a device. Um, Norfolk was not in that situation. And, mm. But we were able to really quickly think 
about how we could use the devices that were already in our schools, get them clean, sanitize, and create a way um, that we could get them back out to individuals. Um, we began to survey uh, our households to find out who had access to devices, who had internet. Um, while all that was kind of a, a stopgap for that situation, the division was actively working and we have received additional funds. Um, and I can say with confidence that we have, a, we have more devices than we have students. Um, and so this particular fall school year um, will be totally different. Um, it, it, we have a virtual scholars academy for, for parents who do not want to send their children back to school um, for safety reasons. Um, those kids can, continue, can completely take their entire education online. Um, but what we're doing right now, and I say this for anybody who's listening, okay. if your child does not have a device, you do not have internet access at home, the first place to start is to contact your school. Okay. The school that your child is uh, supposed to attend, have them contact the school and let them know, we need a device, we need a Chromebook, we don't have internet access. Um, and then I know that within like the next two weeks, um, I'm not quite sure when this is going out here, but uh, in August, before schools start, where you will start communicating out um, for a distribution. So where you can go to your school, go to the various different sites to okay. pick up the devices. But this will be a totally different experience for our children. Um, and just like you, I am, I am always looking at equity. And I remember, I have gone through Norfolk Public Schools, um, but I also know the schools that I went to. Um, I went to Larchmont, Taylor, Blair, Moore. Those are all really nice schools, but it was all because of where I was located in Park Place and Lambert's Point. Okay. Um, but I also realized the disparities that we have with several other schools that are in my ward that I represent, Lindenwood, um, you know, Jay Cox, <laughs> right. you, know, right. we, you know, where we have um, you know, challenges there, but we are working. Um, we have an equity policy that the division approved back in 2015, um, but the focus I know for this year that the board collectively talked about in our retreat is that we are working on equity and looking at everything through an equity lens. And so um, one of the things I'm, I'm proud and excited about for this particular school year being on the policy committee is that opportunity for me to firsthand look at our policies, look at our regulations through an equity lens, work with my counterpart, Ms. Basine, um, and bring back recommendations for changes um, and working with our school superintendent and administration on how we can better support our students so when we're ready to go back into the classroom, we can look at everything from the budget because everything starts at the budget how we distribute our resources to make sure that we can provide the best learning environment and experience for our students. Okay, so I have uh, one more question for you. Uh, I know that you do a, a, a plethora uh, amount, you know, pre plethora of things that you do in the community, and you have an event coming up tomorrow. Or, or uh, could you tell us about this event and um, how did you develop the concept? Uh, so I have a live with Carlos Clanton um, show and. Um, in the middle of this pandemic, you know, everybody knows me. I, I like to get out and to be with my constituents, be with the community. And so trying to find different ways, very much like this podcast here, how do we connect with the community, keep them informed and engaged? So um, I moved my live show on to Saturday mornings. Um, and this particular one um, is uh, when two worlds collide uh, to form a lifelong mm -hmm. friendship. And it's Dr. Wow. Patricia Turner, who's oh, wow. a member of the Norfolk 17 Very and familiar. former uh, city councilman, Randy Wright. Um, and it, Two years ago, I was at um, a holiday event, a fundraising event for Councilman Randy Wright, and um, I heard this story that I had never heard before about the two of them um, and how they literally call each other brother and sister. Oh, wow. Um, and so I tell folks to tune in um, to, to check that out. You can also see the recast on my, um, on my page and as well as on my YouTube channel, Live with Carlos Klan. Okay, well, we're looking forward to that. Uh, I just want to say thank you for coming in and, and um Blessing us with your presence and uh, Anytime. keep on doing the, the, the things that you're doing. And um, I want to thank everybody else for tuning in to Unfiltered with Bob Z. Have a great day.